Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to our fourth session in the John Howard Society National Conference Speaker Series. Um, yeah, very, very pleased to be having a presentation today regarding the National John Howard Society of Canada's Community Case Management Services Program. So we have Rhea Higginson, the Project Coordinator from John Howard Society Canada, and Teddy Chan, Senior Manager of New Program Initiatives for the John Howard Society here in Vancouver. Um, as you know, uh, I'm based in Vancouver on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, very pleased to be uh, to be hearing about the services that are that are delivered across Canada today. So what will the, the format today will be a presentation from Ria and then Teddy and then um, a video of an interview that Teddy conducted recently with one of our program participants. If you have questions during the presentation, please submit them in the chat box on the right hand side and we, the team here will be aiming to um, answer as many as they can in the time that they have. So with that, I will pass over to these guys and say thanks very much. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be able to speak to you today, even if uh, through this COVID uh, new world that we're in, we have to do it in a technological way. And I think it's pretty cool that Liz has taken um, the lead on, on helping to, to create this kind of venue. So thank you very much for having us today. So I'm here today to talk about uh, the national program. Uh, John Howard Society of Canada typically uh, has been an organization that is comprised of all of the provinces in the in the country and the John Howard uh, bodies within them. And typically they've always been an organization that works with individuals who are, or works more with policy change. Uh, John Howard Canada typically has never been involved in actual service delivery, much like the affiliates that um, comprise the country. Uh, they engage in public education matters and uh, the application of law in many cases and the policies that governments create to address those. Um, however, that when the Canada Border Services Agency were looking at uh, alternatives to detention, uh, they were interested in looking at criminal justice organizations that had a national scope. And this is what made a perfect fit for the John Howard Society of Canada and for all of you, because the national organization can act as an umbrella uh, to, to address national scoping issues. So what is the CCMS program? Uh, again, it's operated by the John Howard Society uh, of Canada, but with assistance from the affiliates that uh, comprise the organization across nine provinces. It was actually built on the concept of bail supervision. It was uh, identified quite a number of years ago that the remand population uh, in Ontario and in other provinces was very significant. And, and in order to try and assist those individuals to be released into the community pending their trials or the outcome of their cases, uh, they were uh, put onto bail supervision initiatives. And at that time, uh, those initiatives would not uh, accommodate anyone who had any kind of charges or any kind of problems under the Immigration Act. And so the uh, Canada Border Services Agency decided that uh, this was a good model potentially to use for their client group as well. And so the Toronto Bail Program was formed uh, and then uh, it was expanded across the country through, through us. So that's a, a, a very, cool program for John Howard Canada to have and, and to be able to say that we have connections across the entire country to be able to deliver services to those in need, uh, I think is a pretty um, monumentous activity. So some national statistics, we've been in uh, the CCMS program has been in operation since October of 2018. So we just finished our second year. Uh, it was uh, targeted to be a five year program. Each year is, uh, is an extension after the first two. So we were very fortunate that we got the extension this first year now that we're headed into our third year. Uh, there's 148 participants that have come through our program, which means they were um, 
being held in detention facilities and were able to be successfully released into the community um, for a period of time. Uh, it's important to note, though, that the CCMS program does differ from some typical John Howard programs, and I know Teddy will speak to this a little bit more later, in that the mandate of the program is to prepare and to help those individuals to stabilize, but to eventually, in most cases, to be deported. In terms of resources, we have 15 dedicated CCMS employees across Canada. Uh, that means that that's their full-time job working in this program but we have a whole host of other affiliates that operate on a per diem basis, which means that, that they also have staff involved in this program and who are actively working with clients, but it may not be their full-time job. It's just a complement to other work that they do. And uh, given that we work with both high risk and medium risk individuals in this program, uh, the high risk individuals uh, reside in halfway houses that may or may not be operated by the John Howard Society. And again, it, all of their staff need to be trained in working with CBSA clients. And so uh, we have a whole complement of services available and staff um, across the country. And it's in 14 countries across uh, Canada. You're going to see in a moment exactly where they are. And that's growing. As I said, there's opportunities for other sites to become uh, part of this program if they were interested. And there was a, a need for CBSA releases in that at area. Um, they can always look at uh, joining us on a per diem basis. Uh, so here you can see the across the country exactly where all of the affiliates that are operating currently are. Um, actually, some of them um, I haven't listed on this because they haven't had a client yet. Not every um, area has as much demand. And so areas like Newfoundland, unfortunately, were very um, able to provide service there, but we just haven't had any releases in that neighborhood. So you'll, this is where the releases have happened to date. Um, also got good news this morning that Sarnia is about to get their first uh, referral. So hopefully that will also result in a release uh, as we grow across the country. So now that we've been through two years of the program, there, there definitely is some learnings that we have, um, have accumulated and, and uh, some successes that we need to highlight. Um, so we've we've compiled. We're in the process of compiling national experiences and outcomes um, to be able to make uh, impact on national systems. And Teddy's going to talk about one specific example and and how we were able to make a significant impact on um, the systems that impact immigration clients. Um, Interorganizational collaboration. This is the first time we've ever had John Howard affiliates working together on the same project uh, across the country, and that is a pretty amazing thing. So, increase. We need to increase that collaboration more, um, but we've we've already seen it make significant differences in how we work together uh, as John Howards. We're seeing increases in dialogue across regions. Uh, a lot of the regions are developing uh, CBSA regions uh, to be able to contact their CLOs, and uh, which are the Canada Border Services workers, essentially like the parole officer type thing, um, in order to uh, to work better together and to work um, across sectors. So I think, again, those are some very cool things. And, and Teddy's going to give you some really concrete examples about how we've done that. Uh, plus, of course, as always, there's just really uh, opportunities for shared learning and to discover what's working in, in different provinces across the country with the same client group uh, can really help to inform the program going forward. However, the, of course, there are some challenges. Uh, you know, nothing is ever uh, without some, some areas that could really be improved. And so one of the challenges that um, faces the CBSA program in a way that maybe isn't uh, impacted in, in other John Howard work is that almost all the uh, clients that come through the CCMS program are foreign nationals. And as a result, they're not entitled to any government services uh, funded in Canada. So housing security is a problem. Um, accessing health care, they're not entitled to, to use those services without cost. 
um, not able to access social assistance funds uh, and need a work permit in order to be able to, to go to work and to be able to try and get those supports themselves. So it really does create a bit of a different challenge because many of the, the social programs or, or referrals that we would have made to a John Howard client just simply aren't acceptable or reasonable for this client because they can't access them. So that does create uh, some additional challenges to us. Uh, another challenge that we've really seen recently through the COVID epidemic has been um, a increasing bed usage. Uh, so our high risk clients must reside in a, in a halfway house until they can be de-escalated. Um, and we don't have a hot, uh, high risk beds in every uh, site across the country. And uh, right now, because tra of travel restrictions, those beds are full and we're not able to move those clients uh, either into um, lower risk housing or as they de-escalate or move them out of the country to open up the bed for someone else. And so that that is creating some pressure on the system. So we're definitely in need of high risk beds, especially for female individuals, because um, they don't make up a very large percentage of the uh, individuals in that would come through this program, um, but we need to have a bed in case there is someone who could come through the program and we don't have that right now. So those are some of the areas that we'll be moving forward uh, to in the, in the future and in the coming months to try and address some of those issues and, um, and, and work through the COVID crisis. So, you know, now I'm going to turn it over to Teddy, who is going to uh, talk a little bit about how uh, the partnership between John Howard Canada and John Howard Vancouver works and how the, the program works in Vancouver and um, some of the cool innovations that we've been able to accomplish there. Thanks, Rhea. Hello, everyone. Um, again, it's uh, Teddy here from the John Howard Society of Lower Mainland. Um, I'm going to turn my camera off momentarily uh, after I, I do a quick introduction just to uh, minimize the feedback that I believe uh, maybe caused due to an overuse of the internet uh, for this webinar. Um, you know, I, I think to, uh, to carry on presentation of the John Harris Society of the Lower Mainland and uh, with supports of John Harris Society of BC, uh, you know, getting to practice um, the the themes of alignment and collaboration and learning across Canada has been um, a wonderful experience and, and one that I, you know, am eager to kind of share our reflections on. Um, you know, as most of you know, uh, you know, the John Howard Society of Canada is built off of um, their mission, which is uh, directing effective, just and humane uh, responses uh, in, in, in our services. Um, likewise, uh, the John Howard Society of BC provides uh, or aims and strives to provide safe, healthy, and inclusive communities for all. Um, you know, I think it's important when we endeavor in, in a national program that we are able to find commonalities and, and uh, are able to practice that level of alignment to ensure that, um, you know, the quality of service and how we show up to, to work each day are um, in honor to, to the organizations that we work for. So with that said, um, you know, today we're using CCMS as a, a uh, almost a case study to, to explore how, how the last uh, couple of years have, have gone, um, specifically uh, in representation of our region here. Uh, so for those who are newer to the CCMS conversation, um, you know, you may be wondering how does CCMS align to uh, JHS programs. Uh, Rhea had, had briefly uh, overviewed that uh, the CCMS participants are, are people with no status um, for foreign nationals. Uh, they are refugee claimants, uh, can be protected persons, um, which is a refugee, and uh, sometimes with uh, some sort of some form of uh, danger opinion. Um, you know, how, how JHS has stepped in to respond uh, to this is uh, there was an identified service gap. Um, as most organizations uh, are, most, most immigration organizations are out there to provide the supports for people who are, uh, uh, who are focused around settlement services. Um, these are primarily people with refugee or refugee uh, claimant statuses um, and perhaps uh, permanent residents. Um, 
and, and these are people who are likely not facing deportation. Um, one of the grim realities of the CCMS program is that we are working uh, and potentially work with people who might not be settling in Canada. And um, the reality of, of a deportation uh, might be uh, the case uh, for this individual. Uh, I think, you know, in a lot of the values that we represent across Canada, um, you know, the recognition that um, the human being uh, still requires uh, a level of uh, hope and, and service uh, and, and and that level of requirement um, is, I, I feel like how uh, our organization has been able to fill a service gap that has been identified in our, our region. Um, and, and not speaking for any other region, I, I, would, I would think that that would be the same case for uh, other John Howard societies across Canada who hold this contract. Uh, just a quick definition on uh, the, or just a quick summary around what type of barriers uh, somebody who, uh, who may be going through this program may, may face. Um, you know, people with no status uh, have limited uh, and no access to uh, social services. Um, medical coverage, income assistance for permits identification, um, and other basic rights or, or needs to life. Um, a lot of these barriers are caused, you know, both um, uh, on a societal and, 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 you know, cultural sense of belonging lens. Um, some of it is more technical in the sense that uh, with no status, you, you just don't qualify for, for Canadian health. Um, you don't qualify for social assistance. Um, and it becomes kind of a cyclical process, you know, uh, if you don't qualify for social assistance, you, you know, are looking for a job, but in order to get a job, you need identification. Um, and without any of those statuses, uh, none of these processes can begin for uh, many of the individuals that we work with. Um, as we're all very familiar with and, and, you know, likely the core of what makes up most of our organizations is uh, working with people who are at risk of the criminal justice system. Um, and so, you know, these trends would often leave people um, at risk of being involved in the criminal justice system. And therefore, I feel like it is, has been a very natural transition to work with a new population um, or a sub-demographic uh, represented through the CCMS program. The, you know, the alignment uh, internal is, you know, obviously been a, a wonderful thing. Uh, one of the one of the feel goods I, I wanted to share was, you know, our our national commitment to aligning ourselves with our, our CBSA stakeholders as well as our regional communities. Um, I've heard stories from, you know, and dialogue had dialogues with colleagues across Canada and how um, committed. Uh, teams across Canada have been to form integrated teams and lead multi-sector collaboration with a uh, shared purpose. Um, and, I, and I emphasize on the lead part as, you know, I, I think there's been a collective ownership um, and, and a bit of the John Howard identity and not sitting back and, and waiting for participation or the invitation to participate to occur, but to recognize that when you have um, when you have multiple parties at the table, uh, that requires um, a level of coordination that we're willing to, to step into that role, uh, bring together social workers, policing officers, healthcare officials, um, and housing organizations, and other, other, other you know, uh, organizations that, that contribute to the success of a person's life. Um, and so, you know, that's definitely a point I want to emphasize in, in its, uh, you know, current success of, of, of the CCMS program. Uh, stakeholder alignment leads to greater collaboration towards a shared outcome. Um, and I know that's uh, likely a given for, for a lot of uh, programs and, and whether it's CBSA funded or, or uh, a different provincial or national funder. Um, but I hope to illustrate a couple of examples where where we've invested on that alignment early on um, and has resulted in a level of collaboration, but also resulted in 
tangible outcomes that uh, are most beneficial to the service uh, users themselves. Um, and lastly, you know, we pride ourselves on, on uh, building and strengthening relationships and in, in achieving this alignment and, and fostering this level of collaboration. Um, and, you know, I think when we show willingness to work through the ups and downs, uh, that energy becomes contagious and will hopefully have a positive impact on the systems that we participate in and, and work within. Yeah, I say it's really awkward talking to a blank screen. I don't see any participants here. So, um, segueing to the theme of collaboration, uh, you know, as Ria uh, shared, uh, you know, the alignment of our agency as well as our ability to work with stakeholders um, isn't invested on nothing. Um, you know, the, the alignment has impacted our ability to collaborate and work with systems. Um, and, you know, one of the examples that I want to share is when we're able to, to work together, um, or, you know, one of the examples would be the, the population that we work with, as I, I, I highlighted, um, you know, don't have status and, and don't have identification. And so applying for something like a traditional work permit um, is quite a complicated process. Uh, you know, the, the traditional process requires uh, possibly an immigration lawyer or consultants uh, to help navigate through the system, uh, needs for employment offer from an employer. Uh, so that's, you know, obviously having access, accessibility to, to uh, employers. Um, a need for a labor market impact assessment, um, as well as uh, documented forms for proving your skill. Um, you know, in this was an early theme that I think a lot of regions had had struggled with uh, early on when endeavoring into the CCMS program. Um, we've participated in national calls as well as, you know, regional feedback uh, with our, our regional CBSA teams. Um, you know, as a result, uh, this advocacy has had had made an impact on systems, and now you know there's a, a national change where anyone enrolled in the CCMS program has uh, an expedited process to apply for a national work permit. Um, for us, you know, I, I think that's a something when we first endeavored in, in, into this project that you, you wouldn't think that uh, an organization or regional organizations like ourselves are able to make that type of momentum shift. Um, but uh, it's been absolutely inspiring to, to gain the supports of CBSA and gain the confidence of CBSA that our feedback does matter and that uh, it does ultimately impact in a positive way the population that we serve. The, the next example of collaboration um, I want to share was the internal development of JHS-led resources. Um, you know, this example uh, exists obviously in, in the Pacific region, a region that I work in. Um, you know, our, re our region, it, probably similar to, to many other regions, uh, struggle for the lack of accessible housing. Um, and you know, there was a recognition that it was a, a really big barrier to many of our CCMS participants. Um, the development of a medium low intervention CCMS residence was identified by a need of the organization, uh, which hosted the conversation with CBSA. Um, they were conversations that, that uh, the early conversations took months and uh, you know, the, the, the building of this idea um, you know, required a lot of uh, shared shared ideals, um, as well as a recognition that um, you know the the human being themselves would be most negatively impacted without this resource. Um, as a result, you know, it was about I think eight months of dialogue, uh, you know, from regional to a national conversation where we were able to. Uh, secure funding for uh, a year, a year's project for a four-bed um, 
medium to low intervention housing for uh, for, pe for people who are a part of the CCMS program. Um, the phase two section of this program is quite exciting in, in itself as well. Um, you know, the current housing has capacity to grow into a six person uh, home uh, with uh, the intentions to uh, assign or, or allocate that housing specific to uh, women and potentially children. Um, you know, I think this is, again, a service gap that is currently not met across Canada. Um, it's something that resonates uh, both with John Howard as well as CDSA. Um, and, you know, it's just another example that uh, hopefully illustrates that if how the alignment and services amongst organizational members and stakeholders, collaboration becomes almost natural. Um, you know, in reflection, I, I haven't had many tense conversations around this. and. Uh, when when we become more open and transparent about the outcomes that uh, the organization strives for, uh, these conversations do become more natural um, anytime you're working with an existing or a new stakeholder. Um, you know, anytime, anytime we make progress and, and developments around uh, our impacts on, on, on the work. We also want to remain uh, humble and, and in our ability to learn and adapt uh, to continue on improving services. Um, a couple of quick reflections uh, in, in our, you know, years, you know, year and a half endeavor into the CCMS program. Um, you know, I think it's important to share that, uh, you know, any any organization out there uh, looking to to build new programs and to establish new new relationships, it is uh, important to invest the time uh, to fill in the gaps and learn together through tensions and diverging opinions. Um, it's often those needs that are unmet earlier on that that uh, resurface as tensions later on um, that create blockages and barriers um, to to shared outcomes. Um, we've had the privilege to make the decision-making um, process a collaborative one uh, and acknowledge that each other's perspectives and inclusions uh, are, are respected. Uh, we recently had a new CLO jump into our, our, our region about uh, a year ago. And I think, uh, you know, there was definitely hesitancies in our internal CCMS team in a change uh, and a change of perspective, um, one that was, you know, originally stigmatized as potentially uh, a little more, a little more clinical or or institutional in their approach. Um, you know, or I have to give kudos to our, our regional team here in, in their commitment to to building a strong relationship and investing that time in in sharing. Uh, you know, the organization's vision, um, as well as the, the program's mission. Um, and, you know, the, the development with our regional CLO has flourished to a point where um, they have become our biggest advocates uh, regionally as well as nationally uh, in, in collaborating on, on service level design. So, you know, our commitment to uh, show the human nature of the work that we've achieved um, and not just uh, you know, promote the success of the program based off of um, just purely statistics and numbers. Um, you know, it is up to us to humanize and illustrate the lives that we work with. Uh, and, and I think, you know, a, another example of how our, our organizations across Canada can, can help, help lead the way in that is um, we've, you know, in in any reporting to, to systems, you know, you're required your, your basic uh, agreed reporting. Uh, in this case, it's, you know, they're usually in the form of protected e documents. Um, one of the things that our regional team had uh, wanted to do and proactively lead and humanize the lives that, that we work with is um, provide monthly summaries around each individual that we've worked with and not necessarily the level of accountabilities that they've met conditions or not met conditions 
but uh, really share and focus in on individual goals, uh, the strategies, the journeys that uh, we've participated with with people uh, along the way. Um, and you know, I think I think although it might not be fully recognized openly, um, there's a level of belief that it's that level of engagement that uh, hopefully further humanizes the work that we do and. and um, allows a stakeholder like CBSA to consider uh, that as an integral component of our our service delivery. Now, uh, moving forward, um, you know, would be egotistical to to not uh, be keen on future learning. Um, you know, some of the projects that we we have identified that we want to continue uh, honing in on and welcome the collaboration from our colleagues across Canada would be, you know, develop a capacity for in-house English classes for people who want to learn but can't access alternative community courses, uh, whether that's a financial barrier or social or cultural barrier, um, you know, that that is uh, a challenge when, when you work with, uh, you know, participants who don't have a, um, a predictable language that we can communicate with. Uh, and the second one is connecting people in and with communities of their identified cultures, uh, recognizing that it is a challenging time for them. And although we may not have, um, that although we might feel like we have the knowledge to, to serve them best, uh, you know, many times, uh, you know, there are cultural learnings that um, I'm, I'm not in a position to, to fully empathize with uh, that can be best served within their own communities if if I if identified and uh, lastly you know and this is a more recent discovery is uh, you know investing the time to listen to the experience of the people served um, I think you know in its pr initial endeavor this project even in the title itself uh, community case uh, management and supervision um, probably guides us to, uh, you know, be accountable first and foremost to the safety of community and and uh, and you know our 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 neighbors and and and, and loved ones. Um, you know, when when that language is utilized uh, in in its initial program description, you know, we sometimes fail to. Uh, learn more about the individuals beyond the required forms that are filled and the, the histories of, uh, you know, criminal justice involvement that is shared with us. And, um, you know, I wanted to, to kind of highlight this as, as uh, you know, in a transition to, uh, you know, this interview that I'm going to share uh, with the current participant of our regional CCMS program. Um, and how even in the conversation itself, even though I felt like I had uh, known a little bit about this gentleman, um, that in this 15 minute clip that there was just so much more that uh, I, I had I had learned, but also was humbled to, to learn and understand. So with that said, I'm going to shift gears. You can stop listening to me. I'm going to put this video clip on. Um, it's about 17 minutes, um, hopefully one that is of interest to everybody. Hi everyone, um, so I got Cameron here who is a part of our CCMS program uh, in the Pacific region. Um, you know, I'm going to do a quick introduction, I'm going to let Cameron do a quick introduction of himself and then we're going to do a quick question and answer um, where Cameron can uh, animate a little bit of his story and his uh, journey to Canada. Mm -hmm. So Cameron, I'll pass it on to you. Um, well, my name is Cameron. Um, I'm 27 years old. I'm obviously a male and I'm from Gastonia, North Carolina. That is a small city on the east coast of America, but it's somewhat further down south, so not up, down on the map. So, and if you've never heard of my city, Gastonia, we're about 25 to 35 miles outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. North Carolina is 
a pretty long way from yes. Canadian border, let alone Vancouver. Yes. Um, what brought you to Canada, and you know, uh, and in that decision, why Canada? Um. Well, there, I have been to a couple different places in America, and uh, just I, um, I just started to see like certain politics and views that were going on in America and how my beliefs didn't really line up with uh, the leadership of the country. Um, I had a couple of serious incidents that occurred and uh, I just didn't feel really safe anymore in America. And of course, that's just completely just my opinion on it. However, that is what um, essentially inspired me to come to Canada and take the risk of going somewhere that I've never been before in hopes of having a better life. So I just didn't feel safe anymore in America. And I've never been to Canada. Um, when you're in America, it's kind of funny because Canada is just north of America, but you don't really hear a lot of things about Canada, even though we're just, we're just right there. I was actually in Seattle, Washington, when I decided to um, travel to the closest city that was near the border and just take a chance just crossing the border. Um, and I ended up here, so, yeah. What did that journey look like in crossing? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, it wasn't as difficult as what some people may think. Uh, I, I got on a bus and got to the closest city to Canada that was actually still in America and I walked the, the rest of the way into Canada and so I really didn't have that far to walk and uh, again I just felt like that was the best thing for me to do at the time and uh, everything that I've been through so far my situation, my experiences have been different since I've uh, gotten here. And everything that's happened in my experience so far has really showed me that even though traditionally I didn't cross the border the correct way or the legal way, uh, I feel like I made the right decision. So upon arriving uh, in Vancouver, mm -hmm. um, who's kind of been the most impactful in helping you uh, set up in, in, you know, a new city, a new community, mm -hmm. um, with obviously new faces around you? Well, when I got released, because when I jumped the border illegally, I was apprehended because <laughs> I was doing something illegal, but they took a look at my criminal record and released and decided to release me. There's no point in holding me because I'm not a danger to society. And when I was released, uh, part of my condition was to be a part of the John Howard Society program. And that was the only way that I could get released is if I decided to um, join this program. So I joined the program, not knowing what to expect when I got into the program. But um, it's, they've been there every step of the way for me. Um, they provided me with a caseworker. And, uh, you know, we were able to get to know each other on a personal level. And um, like I said, this, this caseworker that the program provided for me, CCMS, he's been there every step of the way. And honestly, has made my life so much easier because he just, anything that I need to do, he just helps me do it. Whether that's applying for social assistance or um, getting around the city, which I'm not familiar with. He just, comes and picks me up and takes me everywhere I need to go, so. How have you been able to get through some of the more challenging times where you've potentially felt isolated and, and alone? Well, um, I am very, I, the way I process information is different. So I, I will try my hand and I will give 150% in whatever the task is whatever the goal is goal is and I'll do what I have to do to get through it and when when I've done everything that in my power that I could do I pretty much just I don't worry about it anymore and as long as I give 150 percent that's what I do and um, also my caseworker is 
been very good at like reassuring me because of the COVID outbreak. Everything's been really slow as far as getting my documents back from CDSA and just various other things have been very slow. But he's been very comforting and letting me know, okay, this is the process, this is what we need to do. Um, since we've done everything that we can do on our end, just wait and be patient. It's just a matter of time. And also, um, it's been very stressful living in the shelter. Um, they have us in the room, six men, two a room. Um, you know, these are any, just anybody, types of people from off the street and you really don't know what to expect until you get into the situation. And so everybody's not a, everyone there is not a good person at the shelter, I'll just say that. There are some good people, but everybody's not a bad person either. So, but all those different personalities, sometimes we clash, it happens, right? But um, the program has offered me an opportunity to live in a house um, where I get my own room, and probably with a couple other roommates, but the biggest thing is I get my own room, and that is just such a relief. Um, they're not making me pay for it. Um, it's gonna be a transitional house. I'm able to stay there for two or three months. And honestly, after being three months in the shelter during this COVID outbreak, obviously, um, this is like the best opportunity for me, um, honestly, for my sanity, because it's, it just gives me a break, and I don't, I can go somewhere and close the door behind me. I don't have any outside interference. I can maybe get into some things that I like to do. I like to play video games. I like to do uh, video editing, um, some production work. And that's what I like to do. And anybody who's into that type of thing knows that you kind of need a quiet space to get, get do those things and get it done. So this is offering me uh, a quiet place, a safe place. So. With the uh, with the housing opportunity on the horizon here, um, what are some of your kind of goals for the future? What are you hoping for? Um, well, um, again, this is a transitional house, so the goal is not to stay there forever. Um, but while I'm there, I'll have the opportunity to apply for a worker's permit um, and wait for that to arrive. And once I get my worker's permit, um, it'll be good for, I think it's six months at least six months and i'll be able to essentially live a productive life as productive as of a life as i want to which i'm very ambitious uh plan on getting a job and um after after i transition out they i want to uh you know get my own place and maybe you know find another roommate situation or whatever the case may be and just be um as independent as possible so, I mean, obviously there's, um, as you articulated, some processes in place that requires a bit of patience. Yes. Um, how, I guess, how do you plan on, uh, you know, navigating and, and kind of continuing on with some of these potential barriers? I mean, are there other barriers that you uh, feel you, you might not have experienced yet that mm -hmm. you anticipate uh, in, the, in the near future? Well, I have had a lot of barriers in my life up until this point. And um, I used to handle problems completely different. I used to be very, get very stressed out, have a lot of anxiety, even maybe a little like depression or whatever. But uh, basically for the most part, um, I've changed the way that I, that I deal with things. And uh, like I said before, I just do the best that I can do and give 150%. And after that, I just, I sleep better at night knowing either way the situation goes, as long as I tried my best, then that's all that matters. And there there has been barriers leading up to this point, and there may be future barriers. Um, the biggest barrier of all, it's been like a looming barrier, actually. It's like a, um, the, my, economic, my economic situation, not having the money to do certain things that I want to do sometimes not having enough money to get the things that I need. Um, that's, that's been a huge problem, a big barrier for me. But moving forward, I can already see that in Canada, people are willing to help. Per, there are programs in place to help you get where you wanna be, 
get you somewhere comfortable and, and get you somewhere safe. And that's not something that, uh, you know, that's not something that I've received in America. That's not the type of help that I've gotten in America. In America, it's, help has been very scarce. And that's what caused me to cross the border is because essentially I was looking for help. I was looking for people that would help me. I was looking for programs that would help me. But for some reason in America, it just seems like all the wells are dried up there. I don't know why. I feel like um, it is a systemic problem and it's just in layers. It's a really tough circumstance to, to hear about and, and uh, fully understand um, mm -hmm. for me. Um, and I probably should have asked uh, this question earlier on, but did you leave anybody behind? Um, you know, was it was it tough to make that decision to, to leave? Well, I'll say this. Um, if, if you do have anybody that you care about in life, it's always going to be tough walking away from them, um, so to speak. But in my mind, the way I rationalize it is I think it's okay to walk away from someone that you love in search of a better life for yourself because potentially what can happen is that can open up the door for you guys to reunite down the road. If you set yourself up for success and you, you do accomplish your dreams and goals and you do get to a point in life where you're financially stable, then you can go back and s cement those relationships again. You know, and sometimes you do have to leave. I don't want to say leave behind the people that you love. I don't. I don't look at it that way. I look at it like I'm chasing my dreams right now, and I, in hopes of a better life. And once I get to where I need to be in life, once I get financially stable. Once my economic system, my economic uh, situation improves, then I can go back and because I do have a daughter and uh, definitely I, I want to be in her life, obviously. If you knew someone who wanted to come to Canada, um, what, would the, what would the shared advice be and, and what would the shared experience be? What, what do you think, uh, what would you tell them that you, to expect? Well, um... I would say no matter where you're coming from, because I'm coming from America, but I know that people may be coming from all different parts of the world. And honestly, what I've experienced here is help, okay? Like, when you get here, there's people and programs in place that will help you. And um, essentially, when, when I came here, when I crossed the border, I was looking for help. That's what I was looking for because I didn't feel that I was getting the help that I needed in America. If I would have been getting the help that I needed in my own country of origin, I would have stayed there. But I don't feel like those opportunities were available to me. So when I got to Canada, I didn't really know what to expect. But when I got here, I got a lot of help. I got a lot of things that I needed. Um, every Was everybody that I met Everybody that I met, were they a nice person? No, not everybody I met was a nice person, but the good people that I met, it really mattered and it made a difference. And I think for anybody who would go through this program, it would be a good thing. If, you, if you're coming to Canada, you don't know anything about Canada, you don't know anything about Vancouver, this would be the perfect program to get into because they help you every step of the way. And I think, I want to add one more thing too. I think that it's, uh, I think a lot of times when you're dealing with programs and just the, the lay of the land today, people don't really like to get personal. They don't want to get into your personal life and details. And they really like kind of treat you as a number and a computer or something like that. But what this program does, it, it kind of hits you on a personal level because you know, I don't know if these people are supposed to care or, but that's, I feel as though my caseworker that they've assigned to me from this program, CC and that, um, he really cares about me and that's priceless. I mean, Cameron, thanks for sharing your story with us today. Is there anything that you'd like to close off with? Um, anything that you want to add? I just want to say that I think leaving, <laughs> 
I don't know if I'll be able to stay in Canada, but I know that since I've been in Canada, I have gotten everything that I need. They made sure I was okay, and I've been safe the whole way. And even if I have to leave, up until the point that I do have to leave, I think that when I leave, I'll be in a lot better off situation than when I got here. And that's honestly the truth, because they provided me finances and money and funding. And because when I first got here, I didn't have anything but the clothes on my back and two backpacks and pretty much nothing. And when I leave Canada, if I do have to leave Canada, I'll be in a much better position than when I first got here. And I'm not looking forward to going back to America and this program is somewhat the reason of that. So it's kind of like a double-edged sword because these people are so good. It's like you just, you don't get this type of treatment everywhere. It's very rare. For me, very rare. Well, it's uh, really humbling to hear Cameron. And, you know, once again, thanks for sharing your story today. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us um, for this quick conversation. And happy 2020 <laughs> and beyond. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Cameron. Thank you, Teddy, for, for taking the time to put that together. I think it was a really excellent um, story to hear and, and it gave a very good perspective about how the CCMS program can help clients. We do have a couple of questions that have been posed and some of them I know the answer to, some of them I don't. Maybe Teddy might know some of the answers too. But um, one question that we got was, do CCMS clients have any grants available to them for education or options that may facilitate them uh, applying for a study permit? Have you ever had that situation come up in Vancouver that you know of, Teddy? Not that I can speak of. Yeah. Um, uh, no. So I guess the, the sort of long and short answer is that there isn't a grant available that I'm aware of. Certainly uh, the CBSA um, does have some funds to help support clients in the community, but uh, you know, I wouldn't suggest that, you know, they would be providing, you know, entrance to Algonquin College or, or to colleges and universities or something like that. Um, now, if a client came to us and asked uh, specifically for a study permit, because that's something they were interested in, um, I suppose we could probably help with that, but um, their their eligibility for things like OSAP and those kinds of things won't happen. International students don't get that kind of um, that that kind of assistance from the government. So um, it's it's just probably an unlikely scenario to happen. Uh, but if it did, then I guess we would uh, look a little bit more into it. And the second question that we got was, um, as there are some clients who are going to be deported, are we able to help ease their transition to the country that they're being deported to? Uh, you know, for example, do we reach out to international organizations uh, such as the UN or something like that? Um, I certainly am aware of some situations where the client um, who was being deported had maybe some health issues um, that required prescription meds. And uh, there was some concern that when the client uh, left the country that maybe it would be difficult for them to access those meds uh, on the other side. So um, they were able to take a, you know, a three month supply with them in order to try and help see them through that bridge. Um, I'm not aware of any um, direct contact with international organizations. Uh, it, it's certainly an interesting uh, thought. Uh, I'm not sure that we have a lot of um, necessarily pull over what, what happens over there, but it would be very interesting to create a relationship where we could uh, ha hand off the sort of the client maybe to another organization that may provide similar type services. Do you have anything you might want to add to that, Teddy? You know, less on uh, social organization um, coordination supports, but, um, you know, supporting people to like, reconnect with family, um, to identify uh, places of living, uh, their transition back to their home country, um, and that they, they have at least a, 
a plan that they feel comfortable and confident that they're able to to um, to work towards. Um, you know, it is one of those heartbreaking things where you know you work with some people who want who, who you know want to leave and, and are agreeable and, and recognize that, that that is just the reality of their circumstance. And you, you work with some people who have emotional ties to Canada in a very different way and um, still want to stay connected to Canada through their participation with CCMS. And, and you know, at, at times we still hear from participants who are now living in different parts of the world, um, you know, recognizing that they we were potentially a resource that um, kind of helped guide you know, the next steps of their life. And so... It's been it's been touching in, in different ways and and you know I, I think that those are good questions and, and something that I'm sure all regions are, are uh, you know adapting to work with. Well, I, I don't see any other questions right now, um, and where we have about four minutes left, so if there aren't any other questions. And we can pass it back to Liz. We can pass it back to Liz. Um, below is our contact information. If anybody does have any other questions, feel free to contact Rhea or myself um, for, for you know, different inquiries. Um, appreciate everybody's time today um, in hearing a little bit more about the CCMS program, as well as you know, it being a national initiative. Um, and, you know, hope to meet some of you in person one day. Thank you, Teddy. Thank you, Ria. Really appreciate your presentation today and hearing Cameron's story. Um, yeah, it's very impactful. It gives such an additional insight into what people are navigating when they're, when they're working with us and the histories that they bring with them and, um, yeah, their personal stories. So thanks very much to him via you. Um, for taking the time to do that and being open to answering questions. Um, yeah, perhaps if, if more comes through in the days ahead, you've got the contact details here if you want to get in touch with Teddy or Ria. Um, and that draws us to a close for today's session. Uh, just a quick plug for next week. We have um, Mo Kaczynski and Pam Young presenting. They are um, some of the founding members and senior leaders of the Unlocking the Gates program. They'll be delivering a workshop on the value of peer mentorship as people transition from to the community from corrections. And they'll also be talking about the impact that COVID-19 has had on their programming. So I hope everyone can join me and please spread the word. Everybody's welcome to listen in and get in touch if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everybody.